Thank you, Michael. Boy, I, that was quite a mouthful, that last piece. <laughs> Got to hand it to you. So um, I have to start with a bit of a disclaimer um, in that uh, the, the, in this presentation, I'll be presenting the uh, findings of the research that I did for my Master's of Education at SFU. Um, and although I'm an employee at the BC Centre for Disease Control, I'm not presenting this information in that capacity. Uh, so the contents that I'm presenting of the presentation here this morning do not reflect the views of the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control. <laughs> I, you know, I felt like having one of those things that happens before those TV shows, a uh, warning. <laughs> So uh, my intention with the research that I conducted was to uh, conduct a participatory action research project that posed the question, what are the standards of practice and competencies that two groups of stakeholders that I interviewed, nurses and community members, believed were necessary for people who were not legislated health professionals to competently conduct HIV testing? Is that kind of clear? And it's another mouthful, but it's just basically the, the history of HIV testing has been that um, it's been plunked into the hands in, in uh, British Columbia anyway of legislated health professionals. Those are nurses and doctors and people who fall under the Health Professions Act. It hasn't really been owned by community. And, and so I wanted to look at, okay, so if we were to make a shift in that direction, what would it look like? Um, so in my time together, I would like to uh, describe my research um, by looking at some background issues, uh, describe some of what I found in the literature, um, a little bit about how I designed the uh, research and hopefully the bulk of the time on the findings and some discussion because if it's participatory action research you guys have the final say. Um, so background. Um, early days of HIV testing, the recommendations about how to conduct it were done uh, in the time-honored population health process of con consulting with affected pop uh, populations. And in 1986, this group, the University of California at San Francisco, conducted some research and they said, okay, so we've developed this HIV test, how should it be implemented? And it was largely the gay community out of, uh, out of uh, California, San Francisco, that said, well, we would like HIV testing to be done in an environment of support that has a health, support, a health promotion and uh, prevention focus. And because so little was known about HIV in those early days, that there had to be a, 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 a goodly... Uh, um, uh, bulk of education as part of it as, as new knowledge evolved about this, this virus. And you've got to realize, and I found it really interesting in sort of debriefing about this with one of my colleagues who was around in those early days um, the other day, that this was a time of fear and uncertainty. They didn't know then what we know now about HIV, and so everything was emerging. It was, it was all brand new. <laughs> So in British Columbia at this time, and this was the uh, 80s or so, HIV was conducted solely by legislated health professions. Um, so this was nurses and doctors. There, there wasn't a lot of talk at that time about anybody but legislated health professionals doing a, pro providing HIV testing. It didn't stay that way for long elsewhere. So uh, we had the hassle-free clinic in Toronto open up, and that was really built on a peer model. There was some medical uh, oversight. Uh, in the United States, uh, many uh, in the United States and Europe, actually, many sites implemented HIV from a very uh, peer-based or community-based perspective. But we didn't in BC. We stayed with a. Um, uh, a model of HIV testing where it remained in the hands of healthcare professionals and uh, control over testing remains in, remained in the hands of public health. Now there's been some pressure to rethink this model, particularly given the success of these other peer-based programs or community-based programs. Um, and certainly in the era that we're in right now of um, fully recognizing the effectiveness of highly active antiretroviral therapy, early detection of HIV, and how um, the potential for some public health benefit might come from um, uh, early detection and early treatment. So um, the idea that it stays in that, in that sort, of, sort of solely public health uh, realm has been rethink, rethought. So, what did the literature say? Well, the literature was a bit of a 
uh, I was curious actually to find out what the literature had to say about the successes and challenges of community-based uh, workers assuming what had traditionally been activities uh, held by um, healthcare uh, systems. And it was a bit of a good news, bad news story. Um, some of the literature stated that the success of community-based workers assuming a role in health uh, services was inconclusive. As a matter of, matter of fact, a majority of uh, the literature concluded this. There was no strong evidence to show that community-based programming in the literature that I reviewed was effective. Um, the few people did some, <clears throat> don't write this down, I've actually got copies of my, uh, the literature up in front here, so if anybody's interested in it, you can, you can grab a copy. But these guys were the bad news guys, and basically what they said in, in reviewing community-based programs or health services provided at the community-based level was that the reason that things uh, didn't work out for these community-based programs was because of poor records. Um, the success uh, criteria for success, success was poorly defined, so if you don't know what success looks like, how on earth are you going to measure what success was? And um, there were defic deficiencies in program designs. So we saw no net benefit. Now, the really bad news here is that a majority of the programs that these authors investigated failed to meet their goals. Uh, they failed to demonstrate effect in effectiveness in improving access to health services or changing health outcomes. So that got me pretty depressed. Uh, so I went to the good news, or better news perhaps. What do successful community-based programs look like? Well, first I went to this little, uh, this article, um, and uh, Alan, Alan and Leonard really convincingly argued that there, was, there had been a shift, and I assume they're talking about public health, to an increasingly narrow emphasis on HIV testing and surveillance, of, uh, a surveillance of the sexual lives of HIV positive people and people identified as being in, at an increased risk for HIV. And what Alan and Leonard exhorted us to do is think more about the interplay of um, cultural and social uh, health, uh, the interplay between the cultural and health, social environment to health needs and also empower communities to own control over their uh, own services. Um, I'm going to go back to one of the authors that I looked at earlier, and uh, what these two guys did was, um, in their studies, they looked at what constituted success. So when community-based programs were successful, what were the elements that were in place? And these are the elements that were in place. A strong understanding of the population health needs within the, com uh, within the program, well-trained staff, accessible services, and this included outreach services, well-articulated staff recruitment and eligibility criteria, clearly defined, clearly defined roles for the people who were um, uh, providing the service, and again, effective core training. So while well, that was encouraging because they're, they're laid out the criteria, and, and what the, uh, both of these authors said was when these, uh, these elements were in place, the effectiveness of community-based program was manifestly demonstrated. It worked. Um, in the cases where they didn't know what success looked like or they had poorly designed programs or they didn't really keep good records, it didn't work. It wasn't demonstrated to work. So, uh, and nobody paid me to do this, I just have to say. This <laughs> I had no idea I was going to do this when I did my lit review, but there, there it was sitting in front of me. Uh, good old uh, Terry Tressler and Rick Marchand did some research in which, uh, of course, community-based research, and they wrote an article about it, in which they demonstrated... Um, that uh, engaging the community in doing research had more than just uh, good outcomes in terms of the research, but it builds community capacity, it promotes health, and enhances policy and practice. So you can pay me later, guys. That's okay. <laughs> so that was what the literature told me. What, was the literature, uh, what, was, what were my methods? Very quickly, I participated with, uh, collaborated with AIDS Vancouver Island, um, uh, health initiatives for men here in Vancouver and the AIDS Society of Kamloops in designing and uh, conducting the, uh, the six focus groups that I um, did in these three areas of British Columbia. Um, I did two, community, uh, two uh, focus groups in Vancouver Island with community-based workers in the Lower Mainland. I included nurses in one focus group and community-based workers in um, the Lower Mainland uh, focus groups, and in the interior I did one nurse focus group and one community-based worker. You might say, why nurses? Um, 
I, I think there would have to be a lot of collaboration between elements of the healthcare system. The nurses that I selected were people who were experienced in providing HIV testing or follow-up, and there would have to be collaboration between the community-based um, organizations and nursing at some level. Um, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> nurses have a way of being uh, obstreperous. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that, other than to say that um, I use a qualitative uh, descriptive uh, process for analyzing the data. So what were the findings? Well, the first surprise for me was how closely the findings of the focus groups mirrored the controls on nursing set out by the College of Registered Nurses of BC. So these include that there's a regulatory process. We have a college that says, here's what competent nursing looks like. We have standards and scope of practice. This is what you can do and this is how well we expect you to do it. Um, our employers have policies and of course there's worker competence at the top of that. So we expect to build competence within the people who are doing this and you'll see that that sort of reflects some of the findings that came out of the literature. Competent employees, well-trained employees, <clears throat> employees that, uh, for whom criteria selection was well-defined uh, did well. Um, my research was only meant to look at these two, but I couldn't get the focus groups off the other two, particularly the employee policies and the regulatory process. As a matter of fact, uh, the regulatory process turned out to be one of the hottest, most hotly debated issues within the uh, findings. Um, so, the three main areas that emerged, uh, the three main uh, themes that emerged from the, from the uh, um, uh, focus groups where that the, anybody who were condu was conducting HIV has a responsibility to the client or the person who's testing, a responsibility for programming, so what services are provided, and a responsibility for the environment within which testing takes place. Um, so the, the, the categories that came off of those were very clearly, and this is well st stated within the uh, uh, community-based groups that I uh, did focus groups with, that there is a responsibility for client-centered care. And that is um, the process of understanding where the people come from. What, what are the, the person's personal, social, and cultural issues that they bring into the testing environment? That they build trusting relationships, they maintain appropriate boundaries, and uh, they assure confidentiality. Um, some uh, outcomes that or some feedback from the participants. Uh, relational practice. Our our, our, the community-based health worker says success goes back to the strength of the relationship that we have with the individual. Because with HIV testing, if we know the person well, then the strain of pre-test counseling would have to be released, right? So it comes back to that place where when you're within a community, you understand that community better. Um, a little less enthusiastic, one of the few strengths uh, where the community-based health worker has an advantage over the medical model is uh, that they're able and set up to respect differences in people. So there's a big benefit to the community health worker doing this work. There's a chances are, there are chances that they're going to receive more culturally competent or culturally sensitive care. Um, responsibility for uh, competent HIV testing. This is where you know what you're doing when you're conducting a test. So you don't just hand a test over to anybody, but you actually train people effectively. And this is issues of confidentiality com coming up here, um, issues of HIV reportability, things that have to do with the public health side of things. Um, the other part of that is service design and delivery, that you're actually part of designing a service that is uh, uh, that meets the needs of the people. So you understand the uh, community-based cultural, social, and historical dynamics. And um, what some of the community-based workers that I was working with said were, we get info line calls that are pre- and post-test counseling related. Basically what they're saying is we get on the phone and we're talking to people and we're effectively doing HIV pre- and post-test counseling anyway. People who have just, just tested or people that are about to test. People are constantly calling or dropping in because they don't know what they want, and that's a pretty good argument. We do pre- and post-test uh, routinely, we just don't offer the test. So they're doing everything else already. Um, somebody, uh, cautioned, uh, somebody else cautioned us to be a little ca more cautious. We have to keep in mind that a positive diagnosis creates trauma. This is already traumatized population, and this is somebody who works more with people who inject drugs. 
Um, and the community health worker must be able to work with a re-traumatized person in the event of a positive result. And I was struck by one of the earlier, the, the earlier presentation of um, uh, this morning where we were talking about um, you know, the availability of research, research or the availability of resources within different settings. And it struck me that within the well-resourced area of Vancouver, this wasn't so much an issue. But in the more rural areas of British Columbia, this was a huge issue, whether it was dealing with gay people who were uh, vulnerable for HIV or people who inject drugs, that within more rural communities, um, the, the, the issue of traumatization and re-traumatization is big. Um, and the final area that we looked at, environment, uh, responsibility for the environment, um, that's the agency that you work for or the community, and this is just making sure that your agency is on track. Um, so we're, uh, uh, do the people who are doing the testing have the um, knowledge of community-based issues? Do they have the confidence and trust of the community? And are they aware of the readiness of the community to take on this stuff? And uh, one point that was made, I would argue that there's a barrier to access within the current system design. Maybe there are people who want to hook up to the system in a lower barrier way and the uniqueness of the community-based health worker is that they can offer that. So why would we recreate a mini version of the medical system in the community-based health worker? Because that's what's not working. And I thought that was a pretty strong statement. Um, a few comments on cultural competence. I'm realizing I'm running out of time here, but essentially when it comes to the community or the environment within which testing takes place, you have to educate yourself about the cultures within your community and stay culturally attuned. And I like the point that was made by the next person, and, and uh, it is that we, I'd like to broaden that about the influences of 25 years of substance abuse, or if they've lived in 40 different foster homes, or spent 28 years in jail, jail there's a prison culture as well. Um, we have to tailor our approach depending on what their, cultures, their culture is like. And I think that's something that the community-based organization or the community-based person who is offering testing can bring to that testing environment that we within the larger um, uh, community health or uh, public health organizations struggle with more. So the last one that nobody wanted to leave alone was monitoring and regulation and this was one of the hottest um, pieces within uh, the research, the hottest debated. Interestingly, not so much in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, but elsewhere, very much so. They were afraid, and interestingly, they were afraid that somebody would get the HIV test in their hand and they would be completely incompetent with it, and that they would do more damage than good. And what was really interesting about that is everybody knew somebody else that they were worried about, that, but they weren't worried about themselves. So there was an agency out there that was going to get the HIV test if we just opened the doors. And what would it look like if that agency got it? They're going to hurt people. Not my agency, those other agencies. And the other really interesting discourse that came out was that um, almost everybody outside of the Lower Mainland, again, argued for the importance of, importance of public health the public health model of consulting with populations, that that would have to be an integral part of how we were proceeded with this. So um, it's kind of the nothing about us without us mentality. Um, some of the nurses were scared. The nurses didn't want to give up their jurisdiction. They thought that community-based workers would do a poor job of this, and they stated that in some of the focus groups as well. So in conclusion, the literature argues that community-based health services have to be done properly to succeed, and the focus group part participants agreed with that. Um, Community-based focus group participants feel that they're ready to provide HIV uh, testing and with some conditions. That regulatory thing kept coming up. And they named six categories or standards of practice with 66 associated competencies where they thought if it were to happen, these things are important to consider. I'm going to ask, leave you at what you think till later, but quickly say thank you to Hans and Wayne from him, Joanne from the AIDS Society of Kamloops, Megan, Daphne, and Liz from the BCCDC, and all the focus group participants. Thanks.